Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Gladstein. Great to have you. Thank you very much. one name, and I believe not only in the Czech Republic resonating very strongly while we are speaking about democracy, while we are speaking about fighting against totalitarian regimes. It's Václav Havel. Yes, Václav Havel uh, is world famous even beyond the Czech Republic, and the organization that I work for, the Human Rights Foundation, we had the honor of having Havel as our chairman until he passed. And I just would like to underline what an inspiration he was for millions of people around the world, the transition here in the Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic from dictatorship to democracy is something that people have not forgotten. Says Alex Gladstein, who is talking about the future of democracy. Thank you. And um, to begin today, I, I want to thank you for coming and listening to me and thinking about the future of democracy. I know it's a technology conference. I know it's a conference that's meant to look at things like, you know, biotechnology, robotics, and AI. But we have to think about what is the society behind those innovations. And when we think about the incredible journey that the Czech Republic has been on, that the Czech people have been on, we think about the journey of, of dictatorship, of a closed society, to democracy, to an open society. And the key question today is how do we preserve the progress that was made by Havel and all of his dissident friends who became the leaders of this country in the information age. How do we preserve democracy in the information age is the key question. So to help guide us today, I've put up a couple sort of big themes for us to think about. So number one, must we trade our political and financial freedoms for efficiency and convenience? Is that really necessary? I want you to think about that throughout this talk. Can we preserve privacy in the exponential age? That's another big point to consider. And finally, is the surveillance state inevitable? Obviously, I wouldn't be standing here if I thought it was, but it's something that we have to really think hard about because these innovations in our technology are starting to encroach on our lives in a way that a lot of people don't really think about, especially in a country, in Europe, for example, like here in the Czech Republic, where you have a relatively open society, where you have relative freedoms. Now, we don't have to run a thought experiment to see what would happen if we sacrifice all of our political and financial freedoms for efficiency and convenience, unfortunately. It's something that's happening today in the world's largest country. So if we think about, well, aren't efficiency and convenience not that important? Can't we do without them? You know, what's the worst that could happen if we trade away our freedoms? Um, you know, a billion, more than a billion people are living through this every day in the world's largest country. So we'll talk a little bit about China and what's happening there, um, largely through the use of what, what are now called sort of super apps. So one of them is called WeChat. So WeChat is a super app used by more than a billion people every day. And the most incredible thing about WeChat is that, you know, it's almost unfair to call it a super app. It's actually more like a, a total ecosystem, like a total operating system for, for all, everything you could conceivably do. So when you look down at your phone today and you see something like Uber, you see something like Netflix, you see something like your financial services, your location services, all of the ways that you use to communicate with your friends, Facebook, Twitter, all of that is in this one application, right? So it's taking everything you do from the moment you wake up till the moment you go to bed and it's putting it into one place. Now you might think, man, that's really convenient. How easy and effective is that? It's also kind of scary because it's giving the Chinese Communist Party a perfect data digital profile of you. And when we think about what you can specifically do on WeChat, I wanted to use a quote from a, a person in China who wrote a journal about this, and she was saying that she uses WeChat to message friends while standing in the middle of remote villages, to pay for snacks and water in the middle of nowhere, to buy train tickets, book hotel rooms, order taxis, takeout, to send her family photos. She uses it to pay electricity bills, top up mobile phone accounts, make hospital appointments, and check the weather. Literally everything can be done on this one app. But what if the government was, was using that app to start to map your behavior and then start to do social engineering, which is what they're doing. So in China today, the first step is to gather up as much information as they possibly can about you. And the next step is to start using uh, basically carrots and sticks, incentives and disincentives to shape you into a more loyal person. 
so that you would never criticize the government. And they do this through this idea of the social credit score. Now, today in China, this is kind of more Kafkaesque than Orwellian. It doesn't really work super well everywhere, but believe me, uh, th they will try to make it work in the next few years. And the idea is, rather than just your credit score monitoring your financial behavior, how often do you pay your credit cards back, what kind of debt do you have, things like that, it also incorporates uh, your behavior, who your friends are, what your family is, what your relig religion is, what your sexuality is, and it puts all of that into one sort of meta score. Now, the idea is, if your score is not good, you can't get fast internet. You can't send your children to a good school. You can't leave the country. So this idea that they're starting to monitor everything you're doing and then start to engineer you is something that could very well come to, to here, to a place like the Czech Republic, if we're not careful, if we don't build technology in the right way that preserves privacy. Now, young Chinese millennials are caught in the middle of this conflict right now. So this is a quote from one of them. She says, whether we're constructing a futurist society or a cage for ourselves, I cannot tell. So this is the conflict that people are going through today in the world's largest country where they're being subjected to a lot of experiments. So one of them is the idea that anytime you do commit a petty small crime, you actually get shown to everybody else. So in this particular city, when you jaywalk, your name and your ID number and your image goes up on a giant screen. This is obviously to shame you into not doing that, okay? So this is the kind of technology that they're rolling out. Another thing that they're starting to innovate with is something called debt shaming. So basically, if you have your WeChat open and you're walking down the street, you would see on your screen people who are debtors, who owe a lot of money. And the idea is you want to avoid them. If you start interacting with them or messaging with them, your score would go down, is the idea. So again, they're sort of tinkering with these experiments. This is not happening all over China, but these experiments are happening in cities and villages and towns across the country, and the Communist Party is trying to figure out what's the most effective, and whatever is the most effective, they start to implement nationwide. Now, this is accompanied by very incredible advances in surveillance technology. So these look like a pair of Google glasses. This image is actually more than a year and a half old, so you can imagine what they have today. But this is basically AR, like you've heard about earlier, used in the employment of a police state. So when she's looking out at a crowd, she's seeing something like this. So when, you, when, when she looks at each individual person, she sees all this information about them, which obviously makes being a police officer a lot more uh, easy, but when you think about the ability that this gives to the government to track the population, it's quite chilling. And it's not just a matter of what could they do with this kind of technology. We need to look at what they are doing today. So this is a satellite image of a prison camp in northwestern China. In the area of Xinjiang, there are more than 1.5 million Muslims in prison camps like these. So to give you an idea of the scale, so during World War II, in 1942, 1943, there were about 715,000 Jews and religious minorities in Nazi prison camps, different kinds of camps, right? Today, the Chinese Communist Party has more than a million, arguably more than 1.5 million Muslims in their camps. So this is the kind of scale of humanitarian disaster we're talking about. And these camps are built entirely with advanced technology. So again, we need to be very careful about the kind of technology that we build. Um, China is not just stopping with this infrastructure inside of China. They're trying to expand this kind of infrastructure outside of China. You've heard about the Belt and Road, perhaps, of course, a uh, big thing in the news here in the Czech Republic and in Eastern Europe, where the Chinese government is embarking on the largest development project in history. So just to give you some scale, this is 10 times bigger than the Marshall Plan, which rebuilt Europe after World War II. So we're talking a projected budget of a trillion dollars. So the Marshall Plan, in real dollars today, cost about $130 billion. So we're talking something that's almost 10 times bigger than that. And when you think about the number of nations that have been affected so far, so more than 120 governments around the world have received more than $400 billion so far from the Chinese government investments and loans. And there's zero human rights strings attached to these investments and loans. And you might think, well, that's you know, something happening far away. Well, it's starting to have a global impact. In Africa, the Zambian government is spending a billion dollars on Chinese telecom and surveillance technology. A billion dollars in this relatively poor African country. So this is a country that used to be relatively open, relatively democratic. It's starting to return to this sort of authoritarian model as it does more and more in business with China. And one journalist literally said that we've sold ourselves to the Chinese. This is a journalist who's one of the top journalists in, in the country of Zambia. 
In Latin America, we have the company ZTE helping the Venezuelan regime build a giant surveillance and social credit system. So the one that I just described that's being implemented in China, China is now starting to export to countries around the world. In Panama, Huawei won a contract to make a surveillance city in the city of Colón. So basically, the city of Colón is going to start to adopt the same sort of facial recognition, movement analysis, and social credit technologies that the Chinese are using in their country. So academics say by 2050, and that's only in about 30 years, that basically uh, the dominant telecommunications infrastructure in Latin America will all be Chinese-made. This is something to think about. Now, it's even coming here to Europe. So today, through the BRI, again, the Belt and Road, 10% of all of Europe's port cities are controlled by the Chinese government. That's astonishing. How about Italy, the first G7 country to accept BRI funds? So just this past month, Chinese investors recently signed $3 billion of projects in Italy. And Monaco has allowed Huawei to build its network, its 5G network, as part of the digital Silk Road. So if you think about what's going to happen in the next few months, in the next year in Europe, you've got all of these countries, not just your own country, but Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, the Netherlands, Lithuania, Portugal. All of these countries are going to auction their 5G licenses in the next year. This year, right now, is a historic moment for everyone in Europe because you're going to decide who's going to build the telecommunications infrastructure of the future. And I know you, you'll, you'll hear about this in different parts of the talks earlier today and tomorrow, but what we're going to be able to do on 5G is, is absolutely astonishing. It's going to totally change the way our lives work with regard to how transportation is connected to medicine, is connected to public infrastructure, is connected to banking. It's not just a faster internet connection. It's really going to connect us all. So we have to be really, really cognizant of who's in control and who's building that. I want to give you a quote from this country, the Czech Republic's cyber attaché to the United States. His name is Daniel Baga. And he said that the stakes in developing 5G which can handle almost instantaneous transfers of large data packages, can't be higher. This will be a major step that will change the nature of industries, not just in the Czech Republic, but also on a global scale. We're basically talking about another industrial revolution. So again, this is such a critical moment for the way that we build technology. And it doesn't just affect people here in Europe, also in America. Centralized data poses threats beyond the China conversation. We've seen how through centralized Web 2.0 uh, data silos like Facebook and Google, uh, bad things can happen in open societies. Foreign governments can interfere with our elections, for example, and data breaches can happen. This is a message that I personally got several months ago, saying from Facebook that, oh, there was a security incident in September of 2018. Some of your information was accessed by an unauthorized third party, including your name, email address, phone number, and other information such as your date of birth and recent locations. So this is something that happened to me personally just a few months ago. So all of my information was hacked, right? And we've seen this in the United States that centralized data um, you know, providers have been hacked, even Equifax, the credit agency. You know, they lost 140 million American social security numbers. That's an astonishing number. Um, so when we talk about a future, an internet of the future that can actually be safer and more peer-to-peer -peer and gets rid of the idea of a third party being able to surveil or exploit us, this is what Jaron Lanier has said. This is the visionary who came up with the term virtual reality in the 1980s. And he made a call at the TED conference last year for us to build a different kind of internet, one that we would actually be able to, in a peer-to-peer -peer way, interact with each other and do commerce with each other. Because if we could control our own data and money, that would obviously make the, a total surveillance state impossible. So it's a very exciting idea, I think, both for the business community and for the human rights community. And we, we kind of go back to this idea that obviously was so central to the struggle of Havel and so many others here in the Czech Republic of the centralized society versus the decentralized society, right? So in a tyranny, um, the, the king or the lord or the dictator controls everything, the news, the courts, the printing press, the, the, me the media. When we have a decentralized society, a democracy, a, a rule of the people, these things are sort of spread out and there are institutions which provide checks and balances. And this has been proven really healthy for humans. Now, we have to think about what does this mean in the information age? So Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Sapiens and probably one of the top public thinkers in today's world, has said that if you dislike the idea of living in a digital dictatorship, then the most important contribution you can make is to find ways to prevent too much data from being concentrated in too few hands. These will not be easy tasks, 
but achieving them may be the best safeguard of democracy. So we're talking about this idea of decentralizing political power. Now we're talking about the idea of decentralizing the ownership of data. This is a, a critical concept. And we want to go back to the, the, this Czech concept of the parallel Nepolis, right? Of the sort of parallel city. So um, in 1977, Václav Benda wrote this essay that was distributed all throughout communist Europe. And that the, it talked about how the regime was repressive and controlled everything, right? But he called for a new parallel institution that could one day replace the existing corrupt one. And I think this, this theme that he hit on, rather than fight the system, build a new one, is such an important one that as we think about these kind of modern issues and dilemmas in the information age, we shouldn't always be thinking about how can we make the existing system better. Maybe we have to build an entire new one. And we think about the themes that went into the Parallel Nepolis and Charter 77, we, we thought about things like free expression, permissionless innovation, civil society, and a parallel economy. And that last point is what I want to dive into with, with you all today, a parallel economy, the ability for us to transact and do business without having to go through a third party. Um, you know, in the digital landscape, this was sort of seen as, 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 as impossible, but it's something we need to consider because the cashless world is coming. So when we think about the, the way that money works in our, in our world today, only 8% of the money in the world is paper or metal. So most people believe that between 10 and 15 years from now, almost in every society around the world, paper and metal money will be gone. We will have all digital money, right? All electronic money. And when we think about what that means, that means that, that every single transaction that we make there are several intermediaries in the middle, right? Several possible points for surveillance, several possible points for someone else to take a profit, so several points for social engineering, as we've seen is happening in China, and easy, even easy wealth confiscation. This idea of negative interest rates, which may seem compelling, if you think about it, if that's done in a country like China, um, people, they're basically going to punish you for saving, right? So <laughs> taxes will be automatically deducted. So maybe that makes sense in a country like Europe where you can like, have accountability over your politicians and have a little bit of a dialogue. But most people aren't that lucky and they live in a country where the rulers can do whatever they want. So if we're living in an age of entirely centralized money, just imagine what that's going to be like for people who live in a country that's not that different from what the Czech Republic was in the 1960s and 70s. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of cashless society do we want to live in? And I, I wanted to kind of show you this sort of evolution of money, because this is kind of where I want to go. Um, you know, we went from being barter societies to using shells and, you know, precious stones to then using precious metals to then using coins, which are basically precious metals with king's faces stamped on them, to then using kind of paper money, which were backed by precious metals. And then we've gone down this path of, of plastic cards and mobile payments, and that's where we're headed to this entirely centralized digital financial system. But there's a way out. There's another way that I want to talk to you uh, about today, and that's Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, we have, um, in the same way that democracy was a tool that humans used to decentralize government, and the internet was a tool that humans used to decentralize knowledge, right? So in the same way that tyranny, we kind of think of this backwards concept, only a small group of people controlled everything. Well, think about knowledge, right? So before the printing press and before the telegram and the radio and the internet, um, you know, the ivory tower and the church and, the, and kings and lords controlled all information. So today, we have in our pocket every single piece of information that humans have ever had. It's quite, quite a powerful concept, right? So I would say that these two decentralizing forces in governance and in knowledge have been, have been very, very helpful. I would argue that we need to start thinking about Bitcoin in the same way, that in the future, maybe it won't make any sense that a small group of people controlled the production of money. And if we think about what some of the most famous people and thinkers in the world are saying, what Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the author of Black Swan, has said is that Bitcoin's mere existence gives us the crowd an insurance policy against an Orwellian future. It allows us to start thinking about building a, a parallel economy where we can actually build in privacy sort of at the base layer and where we and you and I can communicate, can transact without a third party. It's very exciting from a civil liberties point of view. Bitcoin gives us unstoppable money 
global censorship resistance, and there's no back door. So when I send you a Bitcoin transaction, no one can stop it. There's no literal, no way to do that. And there's no one who can kind of go into the back end and say, oh, I, I don't like this person, so, so we're going to like kind of pull that transaction back. It doesn't work like that. It's literally censorship resistant. We talk about the way that it works. You know, when, when, I, when I use PayPal or Venmo in the United States, and I try to send money to my friend, I mean, there's not only my bank and Venmo and their bank, um, there might be other intermediaries too. So this idea that I used to just give you a 20 you know, euro note, or, or I used to give you some crowns or dollars uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction with a bare asset, that's, not, that's going away in the digital world, right? So, so instead of me and you having a transaction, all of a sudden there's like four or five other parties involved just in me giving you a, a piece of paper, right? So Bitcoin preserves that in the digital space. That's what's so important. When I send you a Bitcoin transaction from my phone to your phone, no one is in the middle. It's completely peer-to-peer. -peer. And again, very exciting for civil liberties advocates. But I think it's a fair question to ask. This technology was born in 2009. Where are we 10 years in? You'd have to say for any of these frontier technologies, whether it's in biotech or whether it's in, when, when you talk about robotics or AI, you have to look at the actual wins. Well, have there been victories? Because if not, you eventually have to give up. But I would argue that Bitcoin is a better wire or an ACH. It is an upgrade on this idea that when I send you $20, $30 across the world, it can take days. I mean, if you have family abroad in some other country, you know, you know what, a, what a pain point this is, what a friction point is. In America, it's really hard for me to send money to like India or China or somewhere like that. There's all kinds of delays. Even when I send money to friends in the United States sometimes, it can take several days for that money to go through, right? So Bitcoin goes through within minutes. No one can stop it, and you can use arbitrarily large or small amounts of money. It's like quite clearly to me at least an evolution of money. We don't have to wait, and we don't have to like deal with all these third parties. Um, when, when you think about what's even happened recently in November, somebody moved $600 million in Bitcoin within minutes. I mean, think about the efficiency of, of something like this. People talk about how efficient the modern financial system is. I don't know. This is pretty cool to me. Um, when you think about that idea of like, remember how people still today, they put all these, all these gold bars on ships and they sell them across the world? Think of how ridiculous that is. Obviously, in 50 years, people aren't going to do that. They're going to use Bitcoin or digital money. Now, the question is, is it going to be centralized or is it going to be decentralized? And that's really up to, up to us. Um, I wanted to give you an overview of the total value of payments processed in 2018. So Venmo, which is one of the most popular ways to share money in the United States today, did about $62 billion in 2018. Bitcoin did $600 billion, and this is a very conservative estimate based only on meaningful volume. So we're not talking about double spends. We're not talking about money moving back and forth and back and forth. We're talking about actual meaningful commerce, $600 billion. So we're already, or, uh, we're already sort of on the same order of magnitude as Visa, which globally does $6 trillion, or, sorry, $8 trillion. And we're already at a point where we need to realize that this thing's going to start to really change the world. Now, I wanted to give you a quote from Jack Dorsey. So Jack Dorsey is probably one of the most famous CEOs in Silicon Valley right now. He's the CEO of Twitter and of Square, right? So he says, I this is what he says. So Jack says, I believe the internet will have a native currency. I don't know if it's Bitcoin. I think it will be, just given all the tests it's been through, the principles behind it, how it was created. You know that it was something that was born on the internet, that was developed on the internet, that was tested on the internet. It is of the internet. And the reason we enabled the purchasing of Bitcoin within the Cash app is we want to learn about the technology, and we want to put ourselves out there and take some risks. We were the first publicly traded company to actually offer it as a service. What Jack is talking about is the Cash App, which is one of the most popular apps in America. When you go onto the App Store and look in the finance section, it's often number one. So on the Cash App today, you can just buy Bitcoin directly, which was a huge risk for him to take. But again, you want to win big, you have to take some risks. I think that's a lesson you've learned from some of the other speakers here. Um, I think this idea that I want to come to you at from a humanitarian sort of human level is we're just sort of scratching the surface here. Um, less than 1% of humans have ever used Bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency. So we're at the very, very early stages of this adoption curve, right? So, and we think about where in the world this is happening. Um, for the billions of people, there are like 4 billion people out there who live under authoritarian governments, um, who can't trust their financial system, and they're laboring under dictatorship. 
financial controls, sanctions, hyperinflation. For all of those people, Bitcoin is a way out, right? So Bitcoin is a way that they can transact with their families, friends abroad, a way that they can do commerce in a way that their government can't control. And that may sound scary to you in a free country here in the Czech Republic, but for someone not too far away in Belarus or in Russia, it might be a lifesaver, right? So you have to kind of think of both sides. Um, and when we talk about uh, you know, how lucky we are, um, not everybody lives in Prague, right? So again, not everybody lives in, in the Czech Republic. Y you might have a working financial system, right? So um, your money might be a store of value, but it's not the case for everybody around the world, right? So um, not everybody has this luxury. And I wanted to show you this map um, that my organization put together. The Human Rights Foundation put together this map, which shows you the, the centralized and decentralized countries in the world today. So in the red countries, power is very centralized in a small group of people. In the blue ones, it's more sort of spread out, right? So you can see even in Europe, there's some sort of like backtracking in Hungary. Um, there's backtracking in Turkey. There's backtracking in the Philippines. There's a lot of countries in the world that are kind of going the wrong way. Um, but the people in the red countries constitute about 4 billion people. And if you think about the, the amazing possibilities that Bitcoin gives to these folks, Xi Jinping cannot control your Bitcoin. Putin can't freeze your Bitcoin. He can freeze your bank account, right? Burma can't delete you. They can't delete you off the financial grid. And the United States, I'm an American, you know, when we're, we're at financial war with Iran, um, I kind of think that's a little silly. Why should the average Iranian person have to pay for the crimes of their evil ruler? They didn't do anything wrong. So today in Iran, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are using Bitcoin to do commerce. I think that's really important. I wanted to talk a little bit about hyperinflation. I, I know it's rare, but it's certainly something that's happened quite a bit here in Europe, right? Through Germany before World War II. Hungary is the world record holder of hyperinflation. Well, today it's happening not just in Zimbabwe and Iran, but also in Venezuela. So a cup of coffee in, in Caracas cost 450 bolivars in 2016. In 2017, it cost 4,500. In 2018, it cost 1.4 million. So you can see the speed at which your savings is vaporized by bad government policy. So again, Bitcoin gives a way out. Even here in Europe, in Greece, in 2015, banks were closed. There was a daily ATM limit imposed of 60 euros per day and a ban on overseas transfers. So if, you, if all of your money was, in, is in, was with third parties in the banking system, you were pretty screwed. So again, Bitcoin kind of gives us a way out of this sort of situation. And it's really important for the disenfranchised. This is my friend Roya Mapub. She's Afghanistan's first female technology CEO. And she used to have to pay her employees uh, who worked for her software company. And she couldn't figure out how to do it because she couldn't use cash because the husbands and brothers and uncles of the young female employees would steal it from them when they got home and wouldn't let them open a bank account. And software like PayPal and Visa and things like that were sanctioned because it was Afghanistan, right? So she had to think about what to do. So she ended up paying her employees in Bitcoin. And it gave them a sense of financial freedom because no one could stop it. And one of these young women had to flee Afghanistan. She ended up settling here in Europe after crossing through Iran and Turkey. And, you know, obviously that gave her an ability to start a new life. So this is just sort of a glimmer of what we're going to start seeing in an increasing way across the world. I think this idea that you don't need an ID to use Bitcoin. Um, a lot of people will come to you and tell you that the real power of the blockchain uh, is, is that it, it could help us with decentralized identity. I would sort of challenge that and say that the, 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 the innovative part of Bitcoin is that you don't need an ID to, to transact value with someone around the world. You no longer need to have a passport or a driver's license to transact with your family or friends. That is the liberating part of it. Not that, um, not that identity itself needs to be sort of replicated. I, I think this is the key part, and it's going to change foreign aid in a huge way. So think about the way that the Czech Republic gives foreign aid to countries, for example, in Africa, Latin America. Um, it ha you have to work with the governments, right? You have to work at this top level. And you have to go horizontally, right? So or when my government gives a bunch of aid to a country like Sierra Leone or a country like Rwanda, we have to give the money from government to government, right? And then it trickles down. So in Rwanda, which is a country ruled by a dictator named Paul Kagame, right? So he gets to decide where all that money goes. This is such a fossil idea to me from a different age. Today, we can just do peer-to-peer -peer money to anyone in that country, provided that they have a phone and an internet connection. This is truly, truly revolutionary. Um, but you won't hear about that in the mainstream media. 
What I'm telling you is probably something you've never heard before because no journalists like to talk about it. The Financial Times says that digital money needs tough regulation rather than bleeding in favor of innovation and freedom. That's actually something the world's top newspaper in finance has said. We talk about what JP Morgan wants to do. JP Morgan, the world famous New York based bank, right? They've said we're supportive of cryptocurrencies as long as they're properly controlled and regulated. You know, what they're basically telling you is that the people in control want to remain in control.、Um, and what you need to be、uh, careful about, and what I want to warn you about, is that Bitcoin can be copied and forked into something that's basically not. Not decentralized into something that's centralized. So, if we think about what JP Morgan's doing, JP Morgan is creating its own cryptocurrency. It's the first bank in the United States to announce that it's creating its own currency called the JPM coin. Now, this might sound cool and innovative, but remember, this is still a centralized entity. They will be able to take your money and freeze it and surveil it. So, we think about JP Morgan coin, Fed coin, maybe the Euro coin, Facebook coin, Dictator coin. All of these coin projects that are coming out are not really revolutions. They're slight tinkering with the existing digital money system, right? So, if you have assets in Facebook coin, which is probably going to be launched in the next couple of years, right? We're going to see a payment service embedded for the 2.7 billion people who use Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp. They'll be able to send money to each other. But remember, that's going to be a surveillance tool, and that's going to be something that can be controlled by Facebook. So, these things, again, are maybe slight improvements, but they don't change the rules of the game like Bitcoin does. Bitcoin is special because it's decentralized. Competitors don't create that parallel city, right? So, and I want you to think about kind of where we are here with Bitcoin.、Um, I believe we're kind of more towards the 1990 end of, of w- where the cell phone was in that, in that particular year, right? So, at, in 1990, you could obviously appreciate how the cell phone was going to change the world, right? Because people could now call each other without having a land. Line, right? However, it was very expensive. The user interface sucked. The design was terrible. It was very, very costly to even send one call. But as the years went by, it became something that not only cost basically nothing to use, was extremely cheap, but has also been found all across the world. So I believe that Bitcoin will follow,、uh, and the Bitcoin infrastructure and applications and technology that you use to access Bitcoin is going to follow a similar trajectory. And when, when we think about these big world changing ideas, like the telephone, you know, the telephone, no one wanted to buy the telephone. No one, Western Union passed on the opportunity to buy the patent for the telephone. They said it was never going to work. The car, who's going to use these cars on our horse roads, right? The, the airplane, it's not safe. The internet, it's never going to work. There's a famous quote from Paul Krugman, the New York Times columnist, who said that by 2005, the impact of the internet on the world will be no more than the fax machine. So, no one's going to agree that these big world changing innovations are going to happen. Otherwise, you know, they'd be totally rich, but they're not. No one can really predict the future. Bitcoin is going to be dismissed. All I'm asking is for you to be open minded because it's the door to a Web 3.0 where we can actually own our own data. It is a network that is peer to peer that we can actually start to build a digital. Ecosystem, a digital communications and transaction network where we can actually protect freedom and scale exponentially. I wanted to show you this image which was tweeted just a couple hours ago from the Forbes account, obviously one of the most prestigious media organizations in America. And it said that the Apple Card, which came out earlier this week, of course, Apple's making its foray into payments,、um, has limitations in the area of privacy that can likely only be solved by something like Bitcoin. And Forbes is reminding us that true privacy requires decentralization. The Apple Card will be better than a credit card for privacy. However, it will, entrust, it will make you trust Goldman Sachs for everything. Now, you might trust Goldman Sachs. They are probably fairly reputable when it comes to financial institutions. But you know what? As a human rights advocate, I don't want to trust Goldman Sachs. I would rather trust the math. So,、um, what we're seeing here is that even like, top companies are understanding this concept. And what we're presented with here is kind of this. Historic alignment of incentives where you can code and build and invest in something that may do really well for you in business over the next decade, but also support civil, li- civil liberties and human rights. This is sort of the way that we can preserve this idea and all these ideas that、like、underpinned the Parallel Nepolis and the Charter 77 and, and the Velvet Revolution in the information age. We have to preserve that idea of this sort of decentralization of checks and balances. of Freedom of ideas, a marketplace of ideas. And we can do that through decentralized technology. 
Um, so to go back to the original themes that I presented with you at the beginning of the talk, you know, must we trade our political and financial freedoms for efficiency, convenience? I would say no. Um, we talk about can we preserve privacy in the exponential age? I think we can. And is the surveillance state inevitable? Uh, it's not. Um, what, what we need to realize today is that Czech leaders, you all in this room, face a historic choice in the next 12 months and the next two years. Will your telecommunication systems join the digital Silk Road and increase, or are you going to increase regulations on the open internet? Or are you going to innovate while preserving privacy and control over your data so that your future generations can enjoy the rights and freedoms that you do? This is the key question. And it means so much. If we think about the impact that centralization versus decentralization has on humans, you have your own lessons here from the Czech Republic, of course. But think about this. This is an image of today of the Korean Peninsula. This is South Korea, right? It's vibrant. It's got incredible innovation, economic miracles coming from Hyundai and LG, the cars that you see on the road and the technology in your pocket. This is North Korea, just darkness, right? The only difference in these two countries is this is a decentralized model with human rights and freedom. This is a centralized model with no human rights and freedom. Its only export is human suffering. So when we talk about how important these things are, not just for human rights and morals, but also for business, you want to remember this image. And we want to think about what lessons the Parallel Nepolis has for us today. Can it be an inspiration for your company to do something a little bit different? So is the future of government tyranny or democracy? Is the future of knowledge, state control of information, or the open internet? And is the future of money, WeChat, or Bitcoin? That's up to you. Thank you very much. Do you want to wait up here? Your answer is clear. There is no question there. And I believe for the majority in the, in the hall as well. I would like to ask you for your personal experience. Sure. Because you talk about Bitcoin as a way, at least, how a little bit, mm -hmm. get out of the system yeah. of a totalitarian regime. Yeah. What's the response of people who are living under the tyranny in the totalitarian regime when you come and say, okay, this is the possibility for you. You can use Bitcoin and be less dependent on the state. What do they tell you? Well, I, look, for people like in California where I live or in Prague... I, Right now, Bitcoin's not very useful. But the one thing that I would make you think about maybe a little bit, how many people have seen The Matrix? Anyone? The original Matrix? Okay, so quite a few of you. So remember that scene when Neo would basically, Neo is presented by Morpheus with two options. He can take the blue pill or the red pill. He can take the blue pill and go home and forget about everything he's heard, right? So you all are being presented with the blue pill right now. So you can, you can forget what I just told you. Or you can take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole and learn more about Bitcoin. And what you might find is this economic system we have, which seems pretty good, right? It seems pretty nice. It seems pretty normal. It might be pretty terrible, but we just don't know it. So that's the thing that I would, I would, think you to think about, I would encourage you to think about. We know it's terrible in dictatorships, but in free countries, it's sort of maybe hidden by other factors. And you are worried that we will find out the hard way. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't want us to find out the way that the Chinese people are finding out today. Says Alex Gladstein. Thank, Thank you very you. much.